As we've been looking at the book of Revelation, um, you can turn with us there. <clears throat> we've been going through the book of Revelation, and we will continue. We want to go through all of these chapters in the book of Revelation. Not today. Um, we are not going to item. We are not going to itemize every verse, but we want to see the picture that God is given to us in the history of nations. Because um, again, the book of Revelation is being is repeating various prophecies that God has given to us as relates at, from the past, and it brings us down to our very present. And we are standing, as it were, at the threshold of eternity Amen. as we look at the events that are unfolding uh, before us. And it's important for us not to look at isolated cases <clears throat> and try to depict where we are because God has given us pages of history upon which to build an intelligent faith as we see where we are Today, So as we look at the prophecies of the book of Daniel, as God has taken prophets, taking the world's events and has put them in this visions that we find in the book of Daniel. And as Daniel was coming to the end of his uh, prophetic place in, in the plan of God, that God specifically showed Daniel events that would bring us down to where we are and, and beyond. But God told Daniel Seal up those things which you have seen. Because Daniel began to ask the meaning in Daniel chapter 11. What do these things mean? And God says, seal them up. They are for those at the end of time. And so then Daniel wrote the events, but he did not understand all of the events that related to the end of time. He understood Babylon where he was. He understood Medo-Persia. He saw the nations as they were unfolding to him, but the details of what was going to transpire in the latter time, he did not, he was not made aware of. He wrote it, but he did not understand it. And so there's a portion, as we get to the book, in the book of Revelation, there's a portion in the book of Revelation that we are going to need the book of Daniel to unlock the latter part of the book of Revelation. Because in Revelation chapter 10, there is seen a mighty angel standing, as it were, on the sea and on the land. And he has a book in his hand. Now, when Daniel saw this individual having this book in his hand or standing there, he pronounced that the book or the visions that Daniel had seen were closed. He came down, as it were, and sealed those prophecies. <clears throat> and so before... God's appointed time, those prophecies were not understood. But we find in the book of Revelation there comes a time when this same mighty angel is seen <clears throat> standing with one foot upon the sea, another foot upon the earth, symbolizing the, 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 the extent of the message. And he has his hand raised to heaven as Daniel saw, but he has in his hand an open book. And he tells John, who would represent the people of God at the end of time, you need to study this book. If you're going to understand the events of where we are, you need to study this book. Not the Illuminati book. You need to study this book. Amen. Not uh, uh, um, uh, secret societies and Albert Pike and all. No, you need to study this book. If you're going to understand the book of Revelation, you're going to need this open book. So God has opened the book of the prophecies of Daniel in those latter chapters. Or in that last chapter of the book of Daniel, which is Daniel chapter 11. And so we are living in those closing scenes. But we're not trying to find one isolated incident to show us where we are. We want to look at the pages of history and see the progression so that we know where we are so that as things are coming to pass, we'll believe. Why? Because God has already told us. And so as we proclaim truth, we're proclaiming what God not only said would happen, but what is yet to happen. Are we understanding? So we're not trying to be prognosticators. We're not trying to discern and dissect the future. 
We're not trying to pick presidents and we're not trying to pick uh, uh, world powers, but we're showing the evidences and the signs of Christ's return. We don't know the day, nor the hour. Let me add something more. We don't know the month. Um, we don't know uh, what time of the year he's going to come. So we got to kind of add that because we're getting in the days where people say, yes, we'll know the day on the hour, but I believe we can know the month. My brother says that we can't know the, we don't know the month. We don't know the year. Uh, we don't have an approximate, but we can look at the events and know that the time is near. Amen. And this is what you and this is the evidence is that God has given to us in his word. So we want to have an intelligent faith as it relates to these principles. In the book of Revelation, we uh, went through chapter 1, and we saw that chapter 1 is the setting scene, the opening scene for, this, for the setting of the seven churches. When you get to chapter 4, you should put this in your notes. When you get to chapter 4 and chapter 5, that is the setting of the scene for the seven seals. When you get to chapter 8, that is the setting of the scene for the seven trumpets, right? Chapter 1, setting of the scenes for the seven churches. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation is the setting of the scene for the seven seals. Chapter 8 is the setting of the scene for the seven trumpets. Now, the, now when we look at the churches, the seals, and the trumpets, these are time, these are prophetic lines that overlap each other. So in other words, it's not like seven churches, then seven seals, and then we'll see seven trumpets. But as, we're, as we look at the events, they will overlap one another. But we want to go through them as God outlines them. Are we together? Now, when we see these seven churches, they're depicted by what article of furniture in the sanctuary? Candlesticks. candlesticks. Where are the candlesticks? Holy. Holy place. All right. Now, when we look at the sanctuary, the sanctuary service began in the spring. It ended in the fall with the Feast of Tabernacles. That was the last feast. The Feast of Tabernacles was a, it was like a celebration of finally overcoming sin. The Day of Atonement, all sin was put away. And they would leave their, their, their homes and they would go out almost like a camp meeting and they would dwell in nature and they would celebrate and rejoice that God had not only cleansed but blotted out their sins. So the Feast of Tabernacle was a type of the second coming of Christ. It was a type of enjoying heaven where they would not be menaced by sin and by iniquity. It was, it was a typical service of what they could anticipate with the coming of Jesus, how he would put an end to sin. Are we together? So this was what the service typified. It started in the courtyard, and the first article of furniture, when you walked into the sanctuary, pardon me, I don't have the picture, but when you would walk into the sanctuary, the first article of furniture that was encountered by the sinner was what? Altar of burnt offering. That was where the, off, the, off, that's where the offerings were slain. That, that is the first thing you encountered when you went into the sanctuary. The first thing, brothers and sisters, that you and I encounter when coming into Christ is his sacrifice for us. The penalty of sin is death. But Jesus took our death and gave us his life. And so then the, then the service would move from the sacrifice into the holy place. And then from the holy place at the last part of the year would be in the what apartment? Most holy place. So now when we come back to the book of Revelation and the scenes are being set for us, God is showing us 
that the seven churches would begin in the holy place experience of the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Are we together? So when Jesus went into heaven as our heavenly high priest, he occupied a place on the throne with God in the holy place. Are we together? Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Now, you can accept that by faith, or you can read it in the word. Amen? Yes. You can say, well, my pastor said, or you can say the word of God says. Amen. Now, I want us to understand something. Notice what your Bible says. Let's move forward just a bit. Go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4. We're studying the seven churches, but I want you to go to chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4. And let's look at verse 1. And we'll read down to verse 5. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 down to verse 5. Five, because it's important for us to understand the timeline of these particular events. Notice what it says. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Are we all there? It reads, I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened where? In heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me saying and which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a what throne, throne was set up in heaven and one sat on the throne and it gives a description of the individual that was seated seated upon the throne notice what it says verse 5 skipping down verse 5 it says and out of the throne proceeded what? Lightnings and thunderings and what? Voices. And notice now, and there were seven lamps of fire burning where? Which are the seven spirits of God? Let's stop right there. So where this throne, what is in front of it? Candlesticks. Where is this throne then located? No, 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 no. All right, I'm going to ask a better question, get a better answer. <laughs> when we look at, we're talking about there was a door open in heaven, right? We know that we're looking at the sanctuary in heaven. Are we together? So when this door opened and John in the spirit enters into the door, he sees a throne. In front of the throne, he sees what? Candlesticks. That tells us where we are. Are we together? Amen. You're somewhere and you send someone to your house. They walk in. You say, I'm looking. You know, you send your husband to get something, right? Because generally, husbands don't generally send their wives to do anything. But you send your husband to get something. And he walks into the room. And he says, okay, well, I'm looking for it. And she says, what? What do you say, ladies? Where are you? I'm in the room. What side of the room? I'm on your side of the room. All right. Um, do you see that mirror? Yes, I'm looking right at the mirror. So she's not there, but she knows where you are. Yeah. By based upon what you're describing to her, tells her where you are in that room. Are we together? Uh -huh. You go into a mall and you're trying to find something. You go to the directory. There's a dot there and it says you are here. So now... You say, I'm here, so therefore I can start looking and noticing where I need to go. Are we together? Uh -huh. So now, you walk in. John is walking into the sanctuary. We're not physically there, but he says, I see a throne, and I see a candlestick. I say, I know where you are. Where is he? He's in the holy place. So then, where is this throne that John is seeing? Where is it? It's in the holy place. Are we together? Yeah. That's, where, that's where the scene starts. So now... When you go back to the seven churches, the seven churches, the scene starts in the holy place. Are we together? Now, what happens is we said this the other week, 
And that is what the disciples said on the day of Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the believers as they were preaching, Peter said the, that Jesus has sat on the right hand of the Father. And he quoted the scripture from Psalms 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until thine enemies become thy footstool. And as you continue to read in Psalms 110, it describes Jesus taking the office of Melchizedek. He occupies the priestly office of Melchizedek. He becomes high priest. Are we together? Yes. So now, what they understood by faith and testimony of the scriptures, follow this point, God now reveals it later to his prophet. Did you get it? Yes. What they understood by the testimony of the scriptures, because they were studying. What they saw by the testimony of the scriptures, God later confirmed it by his prophet. Does that sound familiar to anybody, anything? Mm -hmm. uh, put it on your desktop. We'll come back to that as we move forward in the study, in the latter studies. So they, they understood it by the searching of the scriptures. And God confirmed it by the prophet. So now, did John make up the sanctuary? No. Did the study and understanding of the sanctuary come from John? He simply confirmed what God had already said in his word. The believers were already worshiping God based upon what the word said, and the prophet confirmed it. Are we together? So now, John is, so when we look at these seven churches, and we're studying with emphasis. We're understanding that we're starting in the holy place. We're beginning when Christ began his heavenly ministry. Are we together? When we come to the seven seals. The seven seals. Go with me there. Okay, we just looked at, uh, pardon me. This is the seven seals. We're in chapter four. All right. So in chapter four and chapter five is the beginning of the seven seals. What is the scene? Talk to me. What is the scene? Holy place. All right. So the seventh seal starts when? In the holy place. While Christ is in the holy place. Are you with me? All right. You have the testimony. Go to chapter 8. Go to chapter 8. I want to give you this. Look at chapter 8. Let's look at verse 2. Because verse 1 of chapter 8 is the conclusion of chapter 7. Are we together? Chapter 8, verse 1, is the conclusion of chapter 7. It ends off the seven seals vision from chapter 4 to chapter 8, verse 1. That's where it ends. Chapter, chapter 8, verse 2 starts a whole other scene. Are we together? Don't conflict the two. So when you hear someone reading from chapter 8, verse 1, and trying to read down, you're, you know that they're conflating, they're putting two things together. That should not be. This is why we have to read and study. Notice verse 2. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him, what? Much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the what? Golden altar, which was? Before the throne. Now, where is this altar? Holy place. What altar is this? It's the altar of incense. You find it in Exodus chapter 30. Remember, Moses, what everything that Moses did upon earth was to be a what? Pattern of what was in the heavens. Exodus 25, 9 and verse 40. So what we see in Moses' sanctuary is what Moses saw in the heavenly sanctuary you got it so now john here is seeing seven trumpets are about to blow but what does he see first he sees the golden altar so that tells you when these trumpets are beginning to blow where is john still he's still in the holy place so this is the point the seven churches the seven seals and the seven trumpets, they don't come one after another, 
they overlap each other. You got it. They overlap each other. Churches, God is dealing with the church. With the seals, <clears throat> he's dealing with the history of the church in its struggle against the powers of the earth. Seven trumpets, God is dealing with the nations. God is dealing with all three of them all we together. This is, why, this is why Nebuchadnezzar was able to say that God is in control of who sits upon the throne. This was from a king, a pagan king says God, is, God knows who's about to sit on the throne. Daniel says that God sets up one and what? Brings down another. Nebuchadnezzar says that God will take even the basis of men and make them king. Because God is using these things for his own purpose. For the salvation of mankind. Are we together? So this is the events that God is showing us in the book of Revelation. Now, let's go back to chapter 2 of Revelation. Back to chapter 2 of Revelation. So as we keep in mind these scenes that we're studying, that we understand how these events are unfolding, God in the seven churches, he is specifically showing us that his eye is on the church. He's showing us his eye is on the church. The seals, God is telling us, I am acquainted with the struggle of the church. When it comes to the trumpets, God is letting us know, I am watching what is happening in the world. I am on the beat. My eyes are running to and fro throughout the earth. The angel said to, said to, uh, uh, said to Daniel, he said, when I leave you, I'm going to stand with the prince of Persia. But when I am gone, guess what? Greece is coming. So while today historians are still baffled how Alexander was able to overthrow the Medo-Persian power. When they, when they did a computer generation of the battle, they said it was totally impossible for Alexander the Great to win the battle. And they credit him with all of this great ingenuity. But you know why he won? Because that angel left. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? So when, when, when that angel took his flight, there was nothing that the Medo-Persian army could do to destroy or to stop the advancement of Alexander the Great. But God told us that his horn was going to be broken. He showed us how Rome would come. God is letting us know that he is in control of the course of human events. But he has given his church a mission. And what is their mission? To preach the gospel. That is what God has called us to do. To preach the gospel. And when we step out of our place is when we get ourselves into trouble. And that's why the church is in the trouble that it is in because she is not occupying the place that God has called her to occupy. She was called to preach the gospel. And if God's people had preached the gospel, Lord knows what would have happened. Lord knows of what this world would be. As a matter of fact, we are told and we are, we are counseled that if we had done what God had asked us to do, Christ would have come along ere this. And so we have to get back to preaching the gospel. We, and, and we must understand what that gospel is so that we know what we ought to be preaching. All right, Revelation. We began and we're looking at these churches. We looked at the church of Ephesus. And we saw that this church of Ephesus was, the, 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 as God's church began to grow, the Bible tells us in a, in a very, uh, I mean, you know, it's like some things you read in the Bible that it kind of takes you a couple of years to get it. You know, it could be one word, but it takes you some years to finally get it. But to think where the Bible says, that God added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Not that they were adding, but God was adding. Because now God found a group of people that he can trust the worldlings with. All of these people out here that we tend to look down upon, God now found somebody that he could trust them with. 
we think that God doesn't love until they come to our church. But the Bible lets us know that God loves them before they get to our church. And many of them God is keeping from our churches. Because the final message says, come out of Babylon to become my people. Is that what it says? No, he said, come out of Babylon, what? My people. He recognizes them. He's watching them. He is, he is, he is courting them, as it were. And he is sending his blessings upon them, even without us. We are told that there are going to be people who will be in heaven who have never heard the gospel preached to them. They have never heard the gospel from a living preacher. But they did that which nature taught. So that tells us when Daniel, when, 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 when David says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. He said there is no place where their speech is not uttered. So God is speaking and hearts are responding to the gospel. And so what's happening is that God is saving a lot of people outside of the church. What did Jesus say when the centurion wouldn't even, didn't even want Jesus to come to his home? He said, I have not found this faith in the church. This, I haven't, I haven't, I, in, in, in all my passing through these churches and synagogues, I have not found this faith. And so there are people, there are individuals that God is trying and God, once he had those believers at the time period of Ephesus, God felt comfortable with bringing people from the outside in connection with his church. Cornelius, the Bible says that God, Cornelius was talking to angels. You notice when that angel came, Cornelius wasn't afraid. It wasn't like, oh, who are you? They just started having a conversation. And he says, send for Peter. Cornelius got up and he sent for Peter. Why? Not because Cornelius was ready, Peter was ready. See, we think that they're getting ready. No, 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 no. God is trying to get you ready. Because if the truth be told, many have confessed greater spirituality before they came to the church. And when they joined the church, they lost their experience because they anticipated that the church was going to take them higher and they started conforming to church and they stopped conforming to Christ. And they found themselves almost in a dark place, but it was when they grabbed hold of the word of God again, that's when their light came back on. And when their light comes on, unfortunately, many in the church are trying to turn it off because they're trying to stay asleep. So it wasn't that God had to get Cornelius ready. God had to get Peter ready. The woman who had, who went and got that whole city to come and hear Jesus. It wasn't that God had to get them ready. God had to get the disciples ready. The demoniacs did not need to get ready. The disciples got ready. God got them ready in a moment. He got them ready in one day. The, 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 we are told that when the demoniac came out, he fell on his knees and he really wanted to worship God. But that demon spoke. He didn't know how to surrender. But when Jesus, through a miracle of his grace, removed the demon, when the disciples finally got enough courage to come back into the field of evangelism, they were sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in their right mind. Lord, we want to come with you. No, 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 no. You can't get, you can't get in this boat. Peter, he's not right. John is not right. Judas is not right. They're not ready for you. You would be better off going back to your home where televisions are blaring and people are smoking and, and cursing and partying, you will have a better experience and you will be able to retain your walk better there than if I brought you into this boat. And when Jesus came back into that region, guess what? They were all ready. They were ready to hear the gospel. These were evangelists. So it's not that God is trying to get them ready, brothers and sisters. God is trying to get many of us, trying to get us ready to be able to care for these precious souls. 
This is what God is trying to do. And this is what we need to start realizing. As we're looking at the world, don't look so long that you become hypnotized. You better start looking at Christ because what you're beholding, you may be misjudging and not realizing that God, because remember, God works from the inside out. So what you're looking at like Samuel, not this Samuel, but when you're looking on the outside, God says, listen, I've refused him. Because God doesn't see as man sees. I'm working from where? The inside. So you're looking at that hard shell and you're judging it by what you see, but you're not understanding that God is shaking them loose on the inside and the outside just simply falls off. So this is what God, I was, and again, I had, I, I've told you I've been on this, 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 this social media uh, talking with these individuals and uh, brothers and sisters, I, I, I want to tell you, it's hundreds of people. I, I go on my phone it's maybe one o'clock in the morning and I'm looking and these people up talking about God. These people up saying, hey, can someone answer uh, uh, questions for babes in Christ? These people on here talking about God, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. And, and the thing is, you can't judge their, their experience by their profile picture because their profile picture says one thing, but they're crying out another. They're saying, man, I just want to know who God is. But you look at their profile picture and they got tats from the neck all the way down that would cause you to push back from them. But when you listen to their voices, they're crying out and says, man, I don't know anything, but I do want to know who is Jesus. I want to study the Bible. Can you share these things with me? And they're becoming excited. So again, we can't judge by what we're seeing, brothers and sisters. We have to understand and pray that God would give us his spirit so that we can see what is ripe and where we should be. So this is what the church of Ephesus was. But as time went on, the Bible says they lost their first love. They left their first love. Look at it. Look at it. This is not where our study is today. We're moving down. Notice what it says in verse 4. Verse 4. Verse 4, the Bible says, nevertheless, of Revelation 2, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast what? Left. Not lost it. They left it. They did not see the need for real heart religion. They did not see the need for a, for a real uh, uh, um, um, devotional experience with Christ because they were content with the information that they had access to. They could readily pull up a quotation. They could readily grab a Bible verse and they knew how to articulate the dogmas of the church, but they lacked the converting power of the Holy Spirit to draw the soul to Christ. So they can outwit you in an argument, but they could not win you. They could show you where you were wrong on your understanding of the Sabbath, but they couldn't teach you how to keep it. So they knew that it was the seventh day, but they did not have the experience and the sanctifying power of grace so that they could say like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. And they lack the inward witness because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, I believe it's verse 18, where it says, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are God's. And when we lack this inward testimony, brothers and sisters, this is the drawing power that will cause someone to be one to Christ. Because again, our purpose is not just to inform you of Christ. Our purpose and our position, God says, I'm sending you out so that you can catch men. So that you can win them. Do what? Make, draw them into your church? Not necessarily, but praise God if the church is doing what God has says. But to bring them from darkness to light. From, to the power of God, saving them from the power of Satan. So this is the intent of the preaching of the gospel. Are you trying to convert me? I am trying to place you in a position where you would yield to Christ and be converted by the gospel. That is my intent. Make no mistakes about it. You're trying to proselytize. 
I'm trying to win to Christ. If that's a crime, then hey, so be it. Amen. But that is the purpose that God has called us to go out to show people that they can be recovered from the darkness of unbelief. Because that's the problem, the darkness of unbelief. And now God goes on and he tells the church in verse 7. He said, he that hath, notice what it says, he that hath an ear, let him what? Hear what what? The Spirit is saying unto the churches, uh, unto him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the one. Paradise of God. So what Adam lost because of sin, God promises to give back to us through overcoming. Adam lost the tree of life. Why? Because of transgression. God is going to permit us to partake of that tree through redemption and through his grace. Are we together? So this from the very beginning, is what they look forward to. Just like when the thief was on the cross and he acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged his condition. And what did he say? He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest, watch this, into thy kingdom. When does Christ receive his kingdom? Put it on your desktop. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and verse 14. Because when Jesus was going into heaven, he was not going into heaven to receive his kingdom, per se. He was going into heaven, as it were, as our intercessor. And as he would go through the ministry of making the atonement for those that accept him, then he would receive his kingdom, of which you and I become his subjects. Are we together? And so then, and it is upon that time where Christ promised the thief, guess what? I will remember thee. Today thou shalt be with me. Today in your declaration of me and your testimony that you cannot be saved by any other means other than by my power. Today upon that declaration, you will be remembered when I receive my kingdom. Are we together? And so what happens is from that time forward, all who died in Christ could look forward to the paradise of God. Though it would not come immediately. But oh, brothers and sisters, death is like a sleep. You ever fall asleep and wake up and say, wow, where did the time go? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, when they wake up, it would only appear like a few seconds. They will wake up and they will meet that angel that, 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 that had been appointed and that waited by that grave and waited for them. You know, brothers and sisters, in every cemetery in America, they all face the east. Every cemetery, they are all pointed towards the east. So that when every grave opens, they will all face the coming Messiah. Even the testimony of the dead shows, brothers and sisters, that God, that people went into the grave with the anticipation that the next person they see would be Jesus. And so this was the promise that God gave to that generation, but this promise goes down to every generation. Notice the next church. We're looking at the church of Smyrna. This is where we want to get to. The church of Smyrna, and this church of Smyrna would symbolize this bitter church based upon their experience that they would go through for the gospel's sake. This bitter experience, this sacrifice that they would make, as it were, on behalf of the gospel, as they would live for Christ, they would endure the trying of their faith to the utmost. Now, I want us to notice what it says. You're in you're in Revelation 2. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, And unto the what? Angel of the church in Smyrna. Now, who do we say that these angels represent? Ministers. The priests. The, the pastors. Those who had God had given care of the flock. We're not talking about an office or a position per se. But we're talking about those whom God 
has cause to be entrusted with the position of caring for his people. And so God would give them a message just as he mentions to Ezekiel that they were to hear the word from his mouth and then that word according to Ezekiel chapter 3 was to be delivered unto the people. He says that if you hear the warning and you fail to give it, he said, these people are going to die in their sins. He says, but I'm going to require their blood at your hands. He says, but if you hear the warning and you give, you hear the trumpet, you hear the warning and you give the trumpet a certain sound and they refuse to prepare themselves, he says, they will die, but you have cleared yourself. For you have done the work that in the, you have done and spoken the things that God has called us to do. Paul says that, listen, I have, he says, my whole time with you, I have not shunned to clear unto you the gospel of God. He says, hey, I've, I've done everything that God has told me to do, everything that he wanted the church to know. He said, I unfolded it to you. They had to act upon it. And so God says that those who stand in this position, they have a solemn responsibility. It is not something that just one takes and assumes as a position or a title. There is a responsibility. What did Christ say? He said, I did not come to what? To be ministered unto, right? But I came to do what? To minister. So when we talk about the idea of a pastor, we talk about the idea of a shepherd, his, it is not his place to be ministered unto. It is his place to do the what? To do the ministering. Christ says, you call me your Lord and master, for so I am. But I've left you an example. As I have what? Washed your feet. So you ought to do to one another. Now, did Jesus go around and find a, the disciple that he was friends with and washed the, his friend's feet? No. All of them had issues. All of them were striving to be the greatest. And yet Christ went around and washed every one of their feet, even the betrayer of him. So he says, this is our example as a minister in God's stead, as Paul says, we beseech you in God's stead, be ye reconciled to Christ. So in this place, we are to minister even to those who don't want your ministry. It's not, again, it's, it's, it's not something uh, uh, that you do to receive accolades because many times there are things that have to be said that guess what, people don't want to hear. But you still have to, you still have to say it. Even though we look at, you look at the lives of individuals, God says, hey, my people love to have it so. But guess what? Continue to minister. Continue to preach. And again, ministering is not just preaching from a desk. I heard someone says that when, when, when uh, it says, when, when your life fails, then you, it says, when your life stops Hmm. How's it go? Um, when preaching the gospel, when necessary, use words. When preaching the gospel, when it is necessary, use words. So in other words, your life is to be the greatest sermon that can be preached. So there has to be a greater ministry that has to be done beyond this little cubicle space here. There has to be something done for the active soul. There has to be done something for those who are, who are without the boundaries of the precinct of the 99. We have to go and find the one who has lost his way, who cannot make his way back. We have to sweep the house and see what is happening to those lost coins among us. We have to go and we have to pray and stand in a position of acceptance so that as God is working on the prodigal, that they will come back to an embrace. Not come back to meeting the, 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 the brother. They have to come back to an embrace. 
and understand that when they do come back, they will be your brothers in the church who will not care for your return and who are very well acquainted with all of your stumbles. But nonetheless, you have to push beyond that and you have to grab hold of your beloved and allow Christ to bring you in to that experience. Are we together? Amen. Notice what it says. So when the church of Smyrna, God comes to, to the angel and he says this in verse 8. He says, these things saith the what? First and the last, which was and is alive. Now, the Bible says, write this down, Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, verse 15, verse 14 down to verse 16, where we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with what? The feelings of our infirmities, but was in how many points? All points, tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now, let's understand this. When we're talking about in this, let's bring it a little closer. Remember Job's experience. Remember when Job was being tempted to do what? What, was, what did Satan want Job to do? Curse God. Curse God to his face. And as Job was going through all this, the Bible says, matter of fact, hold your finger. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. Job. Job. Right before the book of Psalms. Notice this. <clears throat> and let's look at verse 10. Let's look at verse 10 of Job chapter 2, verse 10. J O B chapter 2 and verse 10. I'll start in verse 9. Emphasizing verse 10. Notice what this says, brothers and sisters. Notice what this says. Are we together? Yes. All right. <clears throat> it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? What? Yes. Curse God and what? Yes. Who was she being controlled by? He had literally come and taken possession of her because she repeated his exact words. So Job was literally, again, Satan now was in using the serpent. He, had, he, had, uh, he was now using this woman to cause him to deny God. Now, let's not just leave it on the woman, amen? I'm not trying to emphasize so... Because after this, Job's three friends came. And they too was not being led by God. Satan was using them. So now, Job faced, he faced, he faced uh, uh, a universal persecution. The elements, his family, his wife, and his friends. And these friends, brothers and sisters, was in the church. This is where this reasoning was coming from. Now, brothers and sisters, you read the book of Job. They said some profound things to Job. They said some profound things to Job. But what was it all? What was Satan desiring that all this would do? Get Job to doubt. Get Job to lose hold of his hold on God. Now, notice. Notice what it says. Uh, curse God and die. Verse 10. But he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we not? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? Watch this. In, in all this, Job did not sin. What? All right. Hear the Bible in the book of Revelation in dealing with the church of Smyrna. And the, the messenger the angel of the Lord brings to the church present truth, right? And that was, in that hour, they needed a Savior who could identify with what they were going through. When you're ministering to people, <clears throat> this is why it's important for us to listen. 
because in every situation that people, somebody may be going through a similar situation, similar in events, but not similar in circumstances and experience. We both could, you both could lose a loved one, but based on your experience, you could be at different places in dealing with it. So this is why as you move to minister, you must move under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that you know exactly how God wants to minister in that moment. Because it is not a generic ministry that I say the same thing to you that I said the same thing here. You go to a funeral, you hear the exact same thing at every funeral. But they're not ministering to the people. And so the reality is, is that here they needed a message that dealt with them in what they were going through. And the Bible says, as it identifies Christ as being alive, or as being dead and is alive, showing that I'm touched with the feelings of your infirmities. And even when you do not understand, don't doubt. Are you with me? Because it's not so much us, of us saying, uh, uh, um, I see what God is doing. But what happens when you don't understand what God is doing? What happens when God hasn't given you the next chapter in the book? You know, you, sometimes you be reading. You like to see how long the chapter is. Yep. Right? Okay, man, when am I getting to the end of this chapter? Right. And so you go a couple of pages and try to see, no, God is that. Sometimes God doesn't give you the next chapter. He won't even give you the next page. He won't even give you the next paragraph. But he wants you to trust him based upon what he has already given you. Why? Because Paul says you and I are spectacles to the universe. Because they are watching this and as they see our faithfulness, it causes them to recognize that God is good. All his ways are perfect. And we will be able to say with the angels, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. And so as we're playing out, as the plan of salvation is being played out, we are depicting to the unfallen worlds how powerful the grace of God is. Because you know, brothers and sisters, there's, a, there's an attribute of God's character that you and I are seeing that angels would not have seen if it wasn't for us. They have never fallen. They're subjects of God's goodness and his grace, but not to the unmerited favor that you and I are. Because we were lost and we have been redeemed. And so now when man fell, all angels were watching to see how would God respond. Because Satan had already said that God is stern. God is unfair. How is he going to respond to this? And so how, when they saw God's response to humanity, and they're constantly seeing God's response to humanity, it is unfolding a character of God that they would not have seen without the prism of humanity. So you and I are painting a picture for God that is causing angels to rejoice. So if Job had sinned and doubted God, then that would have cast dispersion upon his character. But because he didn't and he was willing to trust, at the end of the story, they could rejoice just like Job could. When everything was restored. Because the Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, in the book of Luke chapter 15, that there is rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repented. So every time you and I surrender to God in a trying situation, when we come back to God, there is more rejoicing in heaven than there is here on the earth. Heaven is more excited for our redemption sometimes than even we ourselves are. They're more excited for us even more than the church is. They're more excited. And so every time we come back, it causes them to just rejoice. And this is why in Revelation chapter 4, this is why you see such rejoicing and praising around the throne of God. Because they see and they're witnessing the salvation. And so when Christ overcame, 
sin and we came back into heaven. This is why there was such great rejoicing in Revelation chapter 12. This is why they said the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. This is why, because they saw the redemption of mankind. And so this is what the church or the messenger comes to the church of Smyrna with. And he wants to let them know that, guess what? God is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. But understand this. God is not going to turn down the fire for what you're about to face. He's not going to turn it down. And he shows us he'll pass through it with us. Because remember, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, that his feet were as brass as they had been what? Burned in an oven. So Jesus is not going to turn it down. Why? He says, why? Because I have removed the sting of death. So now you don't come to the grave as a conquered foe. You can actually fall in victory. You can actually come like Paul and said, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown. He said, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. He, in other words, he said, I'm, I'm not scared. I'm not, I'm not afraid that, that, that the axe is about to fall. He says, there's laid up for me a crown. And not for me only, but for all those who shall love his appearing. And so he came to that point in his experience, not as someone who had been beat up, not as someone who was about to lose by death. And God did not turn down the flame. He let him go through it. And so this church of Smyrna is coming to an experience where God has said there's a flame that you have to pass through. But this flame will purify you if you hold on. If you hold on, because remember, Christ declares the end from what? The beginning. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we ask for healing. Lord, heal us. And God promises. And you say, Lord, yet, and, you, and you leave us, his room. You say, I'm going to be healed. But all of a sudden, you start coming closer to that grave, and you're getting sicker, and you're holding on to that promise. But he says, I'm going to heal you. When you shall come up in that first resurrection, there will be no signs of death, no signs of pain. See, sometimes we approach God, but because we have our, we want, we, we want to tell God how we want him to heal us. We want, we want to write the end of the story. But no, we have to understand that God has given us a path and we're, we're, we're co-signing everything that God is doing. Why? Because just in true are his ways. He doesn't fail. Now go back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. As we end this. Are we still together? Amen. Amen. You're still with me? Okay. Amen. All right. Notice what it says. All right. We end this here. We end this here. Verse 9. Verse 9. It says, I know thy one works and one and one, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I believe last week we touched on the blasphemy of those that are Jews. Amen? Right? We looked at Romans chapter 2. A Jew is not one outwardly in the flesh. Right. Neither that circumcision, but that which is of the spirit. Right? right? So we understand that he's not dealing with ethnicity. He's dealing with an experience. Because when you look in the book of Zechariah chapter 8, a Jew <clears throat> meant that God was among them. That they, that, they, that they were the promised people of God. And so we find this in the book of Zechariah chapter 8. That God was to be among them. And so we find that as the people of God moved on, trusting in him, as God says, your house is left unto you desolate. And he went and stood on the Mount of Olives. The 12 disciples were there with him. And so God was among them. And so he wants us to understand in the latter time, I'm not dealing with ethnicity. I'm dealing with an experience. Many people, when they read the book of Revelation, they do not understand the symbology of it, the symbolism and what it is pointing to. 
they don't see that these prophecies all pointed to Christ. And everyone has their relevancy as they are with Christ. You walk away from Christ, you can retain the name all you want. You can retain the physical identity, as Christ said in the book of John chapter 8. I know you're Abraham C. I ain't questioning your, your, your pedigree. I know that you can go on the records and find and see in and, and the blood. I know you can do all that. He said, but you're children of the devil. Why? Because of how you are living. So these very Jews, while they were professing to be God's people, while they were claiming the promises of Abraham, they were of the synagogue of Satan. And this is why Christ says, his will you will do. Abraham wouldn't, didn't persecute me and he saw my time. And so this is what it is talking about. It's not talking about a physical church. It's not talking about the, the church of Anton LaVey. It is talking about the children of disobedience. Those who are hearing the word of God and they're seeing what the word of God says and they are walking in an opposite direction. They are willfully rejecting the principles of truth that are being outlined in front of them. And because of their rejection, God is going to take their candlestick away from them. And God says, walk while you have the light, lest what? Darkness come upon thee. Foolish virgins, they went out, the, the wise, the ten wise, the five wise, five foolish, they all went out in light, did they not? But all of a sudden, darkness separated the two classes. They all had lamps. They all professed faith in the word of God. But they were not walking in the light. They had, law, they had left their first love. Their experience was based upon the experience of others. They did not have a personal testimony of God's power. They could not testify of his grace. They did not know what it, what it meant to be forgiven of sins. They did not know what it was like or the experience of being overcomers because every temptation that came to them, they went after it. They fell at everything that came their way. They did not resist. And when they were brought into trials, rather than holding on to God and waiting for God's revelation, they would just simply yield and complain of God's goodness. And they would really just bring, uh, 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 and they would really bring mud upon the character of God rather than actually being like Job, rather than just reading Job, but having an experience of their own where they did not lose their integrity. And many brothers and sisters in the church don't know that experience. Because they give in to everything that comes their way. They have no filters. They have no barriers. They have no integrity. They have no standards. And they just go with the tide. And it ends up being crooked. Because as Brother Siegel says, it just takes the least resistance. And this is why I experience we could be like this one day and we could be like this on Monday. Back over here on Tuesday... Back up here on Wednesday, down here on Thursday. Over here on Friday and trying to creep back on Sabbath. And it's crooked because it's constantly looking for the least resistance. And this is why our lives are so fickle. Because we're not holding on. We have not, we have not made a decision that I want to live for Jesus. We're willing to study about him. We're willing to read about him, but we have not decided we're going to live for him. And that makes a major difference, brothers and sisters. You could go to any college in Augusta, you go to any college in America and study about Jesus. You can go everywhere and study about Jesus or the religion of Christianity and never embrace Christ. You can be in this church and have the Bible and the testimonies and, and you can read it all but have never made a decision, Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to yield my heart to you. I don't know what it means for you to be a personal savior. I believe you're the savior of the world, but Lord, I haven't let you save me from anything. And whatever I want, I get it, and I ask you to bless it. Any relationship, Lord, bless it. Not before, afterwards, bless it. 
Any job, Lord, not before, afterwards, bless it. Anything we go through, we want God to just sign off on it. And brothers and sisters, we're going to realize, if we haven't realized it yet, that God does not sign everything. He will stand back and the devil will come and sign it for us. And will lead us on thinking that God is in control. Only to realize that he's not. And this experience of Smyrna, guess what? It's coming back. Because all these experiences are going to culminate in that last church. Every single one of them are going to culminate in that last church. Revelation 13, the church of Smyrna is going to come back. Revelation 13, the church of Pergamos is going to be there. Thyatira is going to be there. Ephesus is going to be there. Uh, 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 Sardis is going to be there. Philadelphia is going to be there. And Laodicea will all be right there culminating together, standing between the seal of God and the mark of the beast. They will all be standing right there. And it behooves us to understand, brothers and sisters, where we are with Christ. Let's not have a supposed hope, but do we know him? Do we really know who Christ is and have we accepted him? Heavenly Father, Lord, so much this building is not enough. Having decided that we want to be in church is not enough. But deciding to let you be our Savior. So that our attending church would be the great blessing that it ought to be. So that living for you and, and wearing your name would be the great blessing that is intended to be. So many of us, dear Lord, have a name that we live. And yet, the pleasures of this world are paramount in our lives. Lord, as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if we haven't, we need to make a decision whether or not we're going to serve you with our whole hearts. And today we want to choose you again because you have chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. It is your intent that all of us would be saved. And yet, it hinges upon our decision. May we not lose this opportunity to decide. So brothers and sisters, make a decision today. Make a decision for Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have made our decision. Jesus' name, help us.